Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. In an era where sophisticated algorithms define strategic maneuvers and cutting-edge technology illuminates the battlefield, one might presume the role of human soldiers, particularly that of airborne soldiers, to be diminishing. Yet, this couldn't be further from the truth. The modern theater of war still hinges on the valor of airborne soldiers, swift and flexible forces who are often the vanguard of conflict zones. Their speed and mobility ensure they often constitute the first wave of response, storming into danger zones in robust numbers or small teams within the span of just a day or two. Their mission parameters determined by the magnitude and intricacy of the operation at hand. For the first part of World War II, paratrooper operations were proving to be indispensable. The bravery of airborne troops had been on display in operations like El Jebel in Tunisia and Operation Husky in Italy. It became increasingly clear that these soldiers required training at a standard above the rest. Not only did they have to be super fit, but their mental attitude had to be tough to stand and fight when the situation looked hopeless. Ultimately, their training and tactics would pay off during one of the largest airborne operations in modern history. In a daring pre-dawn strike on D-Day, codenamed Operation Overlord, Paratroopers covered the skies over Normandy, disrupting enemy lines, seizing critical infrastructure, and establishing control over access routes were all part of the mission's stated goals. These paratroopers showed unwavering resilience and courage in the face of fierce resistance unfamiliar terrain, and scattered drops. And their efforts were instrumental in making the amphibious assault a success and marking the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. Airborne operations were born in those days, and their doctrine has not changed much. Airborne operations are divided into marshalling, air movement, landing, and ground combat phases. During the marshalling phase, paratroopers are divided into their chocks and flights, and air and ground crews ensure that the aircraft is ready for the flights. This phase also includes the paratroopers getting kitted out in their gear for the jump. Qualified instructors, riggers, and jump masters personally check the jump gear of every paratrooper. Paratroopers are required to carry from about 100 to 150 pounds, or 45 to 68 kilograms of equipment during jumps. The weight includes their main parachute, reserve parachute, rucksack, and rifle. They carry their rucksack suspended between their legs. Inside the backpack, they carry ammunition, water, rations, and sometimes support weapon ammunition for at least 72 hours. The main parachutes are carried on their abdomens and their reserves on their backs. Paratroopers enter their jump aircraft according to a PAX list drawn up by the exercise or operational commander beforehand. 
The list may have to be adjusted shortly before takeoff after the final manifest call. In cases where some jumpers are unable to attend due to sickness or personal injury. For the safety of the jumpers and the air crew, and to make the process simpler, the jumpers go through pre-jump drills, which start at 10 minutes. At the 10 minute mark, the jumpers stand up and then they hook up their static lines. Static lines and personal equipment are checked by the jumpers and their buddies. At one minute, the red jump lights go on and the first jumpers are ordered to stand at the door. Once the green light goes on, jump masters give the go command. At this point, paratroopers start to file out of the jump doors. Their yellow static lines automatically deploy their paratroopers. The speed at which the jumpers exit ensures they all fit into the predetermined drop zone, or DZ. DZ size is determined by the aircraft which is used for the jump. Smaller teams such as special forces or pararescue persons or PJs utilize smaller DZs because they use ram air parachutes, which makes it much easier to reach a small DZ. PJs can be inserted in any manner of ways, with parachuting being only one of them. PJs conduct personal recovery and combat search and rescue operations, as well as other missions for the U.S. military and its allies. PJs usually get called upon when an aircraft has been downed and they must find and recover the crew. The U.S. military invests many millions of dollars in their pilots. Aircraft are quicker to replace, but not their pilots. Therefore, the PJs are inserted to find and recover them. Upon landing in the DZ, the backpack, also sometimes called the paratrooper's bag, is released to touch down before the jumper to minimize his impact. This bag may also be called the leg bag. Because of its weight, the backpack remains attached to the paratrooper harness via a 15-foot long lowering line. Inside the typical paratrooper bag, the soldier will have items like entrenching tools, additional uniform parts, a sleeping bag, raincoat, additional optical equipment, rations, communications equipment or radio, combat webbing, fire starter kits, survival kits, their ammunition already inserted into magazines, empty magazine pouches, and a host of other bits and pieces. Water and ammunition weigh the most, but are crucial to the operation. During water landings, the paras still must wear flotation devices that can support all their weight. U.S. military pilots always face the possibility of ejection. Ejection seat drills from helicopters are a standard part of the U.S. Air Force's outdoor training for new pilots. The purpose of this procedure is to expose them to the actual dynamics of a high-altitude ejection. It also prepares them for actual life parachute malfunctions. When the parachute suspension lines twist, it can cause uncontrollable spins and a faster descent rate both of which are dangerous. Pilots can prepare for these kinds of challenges and perfect their body control during freefall 
by practicing in wind towers and with actual jumps. Canopy cutaway and reserve deployment may be necessary if a parachute malfunctions, such as a line over. When the parachute lines cross over the canopy or is damaged, such as with a hole. Trainee pilots are trained on how to execute the paratrooper roll or parachute landing fall, PLF, when hitting the ground. They keep their legs straight and together and roll onto their sides to absorb shock upon landing. In fact, the parachute landing fall is one of the first things all paratroopers are taught. U.S. Army paratroopers are trained at jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. The men and women who are trained here first must qualify even to attend the training, since physical demands are so high. There are three distinct parts to the training that each last one week. During ground week, trainees practice fundamentals like parachute landing fall, a simulated door exit, and the 34-foot tower. This stage is all about getting fit and feeling confident about yourself. During tower week, trainees simulate the sensation of parachuting by practicing on jump towers 250 feet in height. This entails training using a parachute, a harness shed, a swing lander trainer, and a mass exit. The final week of training consists of five parachute jumps from a C-130 or C-17 aircraft, putting into practice the knowledge and skills acquired in the preceding two weeks. Paratroopers who make it through this week successfully earn the right to call themselves airborne, with the wings to prove it. Other methods for getting soldiers or Marines into their areas of operations, or AO, are called helicopter casting or just helo casting. During helo casting, the Marines jump into the water from a slow moving SH 60 Seahawk helicopter, which is about 10 feet off the surface. The technique gets the Marines quickly into the AO without rousing too much suspicion. Marines enter the water using the correct jump technique. And once they are in the water, they swim to shore or use a Zodiac or combat rubber raiding craft. When swimming, they use flotation devices and flippers. Extraction of the Marines can be accomplished by various means. One such way is called the Special Patrol Insertion Extraction System, or SPIES. A rope is lowered into the water with provision for attachment of harnesses worn by the Marines. The helicopter then gains altitude with the Marines attached to the rope and extracts them to a safe rendezvous. Helo casting and spy can be used from various rotor craft, such as the Eurocopter Super Puma or EC-225. Troops are taught how to move into the doorway and exit the helicopter at short intervals while it moves forward to prevent body collisions in the water. Extraction is also viable using a rope ladder. Rope ladders require the troops to get out of the water using muscle power, which can be physically draining because they are wet. In other cases, the soldiers in question can enter the water using the fast roping method. In this method, soldiers wear special gloves and slide from the helicopter into the water. It is also part of the spies method. Finally, everything they can do in the daytime must be repeated in nighttime training. In this way, troops are ready for any scenario they might face in the future. Since aircraft were invented, 
they have not only been able to deliver ordnance and cargo, but also some of the most specialized soldiers the world has ever known. Paratroopers. Since World War II, paratroopers or airborne soldiers have worn their wings with pride. From mass jumps for large-scale military operations to small teams being inserted for specialized missions, these troops are ready for anything thrown their way. Their readiness is ensured by training, which pushes their limits both physically and psychologically. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time. Thank you.